Um. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do the uh, the formal intro, and then we'll get the uh, conversation underway. Thank you for coming through, everybody. All right. Hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. I hope you're doing well. Uh, we are about to embark on an exclusive conversation and interview with the one and only singer, songwriter, rapper, producer, extraordinaire, one Mr. Kevin Abstract. His brand new LP Blanket is out now. We're going to talk about that album and anything else that comes up in the conversation. Uh, Kevin, thank you for coming through. Thanks for having me. You look good, man. You look good. No, you look good. You look healthy and happy, you, colorful. That's what I was going to say about you. I just took a shower. Oh, okay, you're exfoliated. Mm -hmm. Do you do you do do you do like some scrubbing down, just making sure the 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 skin layers are fresh? Um, not as much as I should be doing. You honestly. should be doing it more. You should be doing yeah. it more. <laughs> but how do you take your coffee? um black just no sugar no nothing nothing this is black cold brew cold but you you like a cold brew gets me going do you prefer a dark or a, a, a light roast does that matter to um, you i've been doing dark lately doing dark what about you um I, i've been getting more into into light roast but i, I can go either way I, th I think it's i think it's a bit fruitier you know it's it's not it's not as bitter if I'm gonna be uh, when, if I'm gonna be drinking a black because I don't put sugar in it anyway. When did you start drinking coffee? Like like just in, in, in embarrassingly recently. Like I'm not even Me gonna. Too. Oh, okay, okay, cool, 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 All right, cool. cool. So Same there, so there's no reason to be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We could be open about that together. Exactly. All right. Um, <laughs> new record is out. Everybody's been listening to it. Um, d d does it feel like there's a bit of a weight off your shoulders now with it just like kind of being out there? Yeah, totally. Um, it just felt like I was taking so long trying to get a body of work together. So it's nice having something out there and seeing people react to it feels good always. I mean, to kind of get into the material of it in, in maybe more of sort of like a broader sense to start, like, was there an added pressure to the fact that you were giving fans something stylistically and sonically that is just so far from maybe what they would expect given, you know, where things kind of left off with Brockhampton? Yeah. And I think I leaned into that pressure a little bit because right. it, it just made me get more creative in the studio really. And like, just try new things. Hmm. And, but I mean, for anybody who's been listening to your stuff for a while, like, I, I don't think they've been, you know, especially fans of like American Boyfriend, you know, they, they can't possibly be surprised to hear some like the, you know, Indian singer songwriter influences on the record for sure. Yeah, I think if you caught on to what I was doing, like, um, later down the line with BH's success, then maybe this might be a little like hmm. polarizing or like jarring. But yeah, I feel like um, a lot of my day one fans kind of were stoked on me kind of going back towards like guitar driven music. Hmm. And uh, I mean, in, in that sense, do you feel like this album is like a return to form or is it you moving forward, you know, or is it a little bit of both? I think a mix of both. I think it was like me naturally just wanted to make stuff that I would listen to. Um, but then also wanting to like, try to find new pockets and, and like which ways I could use my voice in a way where like you didn't usually hear me do some shit like that on a, the Brockhampton stuff. Like I'm whispering a lot more and kind of doing like some Elliot Smith stuff. And I, I feel like I had more freedom in general to not like have to just turn up with raps on every song. Like that was really refreshing for me. Mm. Creative. Yeah. Uh, you know, let me get into the vocals a little bit, because, I mean, as different genre wise and stylistically as, you know, your work from American Boyfriend to Brockhampton is things like your singing voice and your vocals in general are pretty recognizable, you know, between those two projects. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the case um, for Blanket, which I think is a conscious choice, uh, you know, in in some sense, were you trying to go for something that didn't necessarily sound like you or what sort of fans or listeners perceive to be as you or the way that you sound generally 
yeah totally like i wanted to be a brand new character a brand new artist um while also doing what felt right in the moment but i, I definitely wanted to just be something new i mean i i got a sense of the character thing that you just kind of said there i mean is is that something that um you you would say just like kind of happened inadvertently by experimenting the way you were experimenting or did you go into this record with like i have a character in mind or a person or a personality that i want to embody and i'm going to sort of live that out in the music it happened through creating i would say mm. i think and and where do you feel like you ended up kind of like landing with this persona that you ended up embodying on the record? You know, it's like what what are kind of the characteristics of this this person, this voice that you're kind of bringing to these songs? Um, he's heroic and thoughtful, uh, and and quiet, and that's kind of like what I was channeling throughout recording. And then when we did the videos, it was kind of like hyper-focused on that even more, I guess. Hmm. I mean, w would you also say there's, um at, at, at least for me, the tracks that stood out to me the most as I was kind of listening to the record, there was almost a sense of like uh, fear and uh, maybe even like innocence to it as as well that it felt like you were exploring in in, in a way. Yeah, especially um, on the more like nostalgic sounding songs, I think there you could feel the fear. Um, but it's not like I think sometimes in the BH stuff, when there was fear, I kind of just sounded scared. Mm -hmm. This is more so like uh, me being my current age, looking back and pulling from those memories and not um, being like stuck in the memory. I guess more so. I mean, nostalgically or personally, what, what do you feel like you or this character has to be afraid of on this record? That's, that's kind of like driving the, the emotions of it. Um, probably just like facing what's in front of you. Hmm. Not, not, not like the idea of growing up, but just like, uh, just like acceptance. Yeah. I know it's a bit vague. No, no, it's fine. Um, well, I mean, you know, how much of that kind of reflection on growing up draws back to some of the nostalgia that you were talking about as well? Because I, I feel like there is a really big component of, of memories on this project as well. Like, you know, given your career, given what recently kind of, you know, came about with Brockhampton coming apart in the way that it did and that sort of that, that chapter closing, you, you have so much to look back on you know, at this point in your career, like what sort of points for you creatively or historically, did you find yourself kind of drawing back to the most, uh, to, to kind of give yourself, you know, points of inspiration for these songs? Um, I tried to think about music that all of my crushes would play for me mm. when I was like 14 or 15. And a lot of those, I, I realized that through, listening to a lot of Alex G and the chords reminded me of Modest Mouse chords mm -hmm. and every boy I had a crush on was like obsessed with Modest Mouse. So then I just like found myself making music that sounded like stuff they would show me basically. And I naturally would just like want to play that and listen to it over and over and over again. When you were writing these songs, did you like <clears throat> literally go back and listen to some of those records or were you mostly like working off of like kind of like a memory or an impression of like how how those times felt it was a memory for sure because i i don't want it, i don't want to be like too close to the reference uh i kind of want it to be foggy and i think you can kind of feel that in the music but um hmm. but yeah yeah i mean you know aside from like alex g and i also know that um you know, you have uh, MJ Lenderman uh, involved in the record. Uh, also, Kara Jackson, who's fantastic and, and made one of my favorite albums so far this year. Um, you know, are there any sort of like songwriters on the indie scene currently? Because, you know, you reference back to Elliot Smith, but like the generation of 
the sort of like, you know, an artist cut from that cloth today is totally different. It's like been very much swapped out for a new, you know, sort of like a, you know, new, new world of voices and, you know, lyricists out there. Like, you know, who, who else has been kind of like grabbing your attention or grabbing your ear along those lines? Um, I like Jane Remover. Hmm. And I like, yeah, yeah, like newer stuff is, is that and then like a lot of rap music, honestly. Hmm. And, you know, as as a music fan and as a creative, uh, especially given with how hard of a turn that you made on this record, like at, how disparate and how separate are these worlds for you? Because, you know, I, I noticed that you were pretty careful about like making sure that like even some of the stuff that you'd done that might be more rap centric on American Boyfriend or even Arizona Baby. It's it sort of seemed like you were pretty careful about allowing any of that to seep into this. You know, the, the sort of direction and sound you were going for on this one was pretty pure. Yeah, I feel like um, well, a lot of my earlier work, I was trying to merge too many sounds into one project. And um, if it's more challenging for me to try to like make something that feels as cohesive as this is to me, sonically, mm -hmm. through, by just committing to uh, a genre or a vibe, you know, or a certain swag. Where, where do you feel like that struggle kind of kind of comes from, you know, whether, 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 no matter what the genre is that you're focusing on. I think probably just from me growing up online, honestly, like just like constantly being on forums and like looking at all the different types of sounds and like different things that my favorite artists were inspired by. I, th I think I kind of like have always just been drawn to the idea of that and i do love the idea of like merging worlds or people hearing my music and not knowing if uh it's a black or white artist when they first hear it i do love that kind of shit but like it is it's just more challenging to try to lean into something that feels you know like not throwing a, a 16 bar rap verse you know on the second verse kind of thing mm. and just committing to singing the whole time, whole way through. It's also something I've always wanted to do, I think. Um, but I think I, I was just a little insecure in the past about my singing voice, if I'm being honest. And, and I feel like uh, I just found the right pocket for it with this album. Sorry, just like so many things to jump off of there. Like, well, I, I guess specifically in regards to your your singing voice, what do you feel like you were doing in the process of creating this record that made you feel more comfortable with it? Did it come through certain inflections, some of the effects and sort of pitches that you were playing with? I think so, yeah. And um, and also just something about knowing I was making music that I actually wanted to listen back to, hmm. you know? And um, it got foggy at times, I think, throughout the end of BH, because there's a lot of stuff I was doing just me personally, when it was like my turn to go up to the mic, I was kind of doing stuff that was just like fan service, I think, or at least this idea I had in my head of what I thought our audience wanted for me. Uh, and with this, it kind of just felt like I could just start over and, and and make something that was true to me in that in that moment. And that's really all I've ever wanted to do. And, and it was nice to like, you know, um, find that confidence within myself to allow myself to do that again. You know, it, it's sort of interesting earlier hearing you kind of refer to growing up in a way as a music fan and as a listener where you're kind of like, you know, in, indulging in and digesting all of these different sounds and genres and styles that are inspiring you in a variety of different ways and, you know, pushing you in a lot of different directions. And, you know, part of what for me has been so inspiring and interesting, you know, um, uh, what, what's made you so interesting as an artist is that, you know, you, you come off to me as a part of a new generation of creators who, you know, embrace a wide array of different things and are, aren't afraid to sort of like do it all, you know, and, and it's, and it sounds like, you know, you really have a deep appreciation for all the different genres that you're inspired by. You're not just like kind of dabbling in it a little bit just to play with it. And, you know, it's, it's, again, it's, 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 um, 
interesting in a sense to hear you kind of describe that as something that you all, almost need to break away from in a way. You know, do you feel like with that kind of increasingly being more of a standard among music fans that there's sort of like a focus or a purity that's been lost in this embrace of maximalism of, of everything uh, as opposed to kind of just like focusing on stuff that maybe you're the most passionate yeah. about or specializing? I don't know. Yeah, in a way. In a way, for sure. And also, it's like a comfort zone thing. Like, I'm more comfortable with, like, uh, genre bending and, like, you know, like what BH did for a long time. That's, like, an easier um, approach for me when I'm in the studio. And there are times on this album where I'm definitely trying to, like, you know, do, uh, like, a Jodeci melody over Modest Mouse chords or something like that. Like, I'm definitely still trying to bend genres and make it make sense in a new way but i just don't want to go so like so left where it doesn't like uh sound like i could play it over and over and over in my car or something but yeah but to answer your question yeah i think so i i agree with that i mean i i think uh you know, with you kind of like referencing back to Elliot Smith earlier, like as you kind of trend in this more focused direction on a record like this, in your own mind as like a fan of this stuff, you know, does, is there any kind of pressure created as like, oh man, this needs to like, you know, kind of stand out or be significant in this style or lane of music if I'm going to kind of like, you know, really kind of dig myself, you know, kind of a lane in this or something? Yeah, always. I mean, I'm always thinking about the past. But I'm also thinking about like what's happening right now and across all genres. And like when I first reached out to MJ Linderman, I like um, I sent him some like demos of stuff I was doing. I sent some demos to uh, another a few other bands too, just to see like if it was if it felt genuine. <laughs> I guess like if it felt like it was coming from a true place, like you know. And to get their blessing, I think uh gave me a little bit more confidence especially because like it's music i grew up listening to just as much as i was listening to like all the uh the rap stuff that i've talked about in other interviews and things like that but yeah it's so i mean in you know uh artist to artist validation like that that you know you you clearly needed in that moment it, you know for you does that hit in kind of a different way as opposed to like you know, fan validation per se, because, you know, you, you sort of spoke earlier about like maybe some of the Brockhampton stuff you were doing uh, maybe kind of came from a place of like, this is what I know the fans are going to want, or this is what would make them happy or make them feel like this is the best we're doing or, you know, uh, a, a, a pleasurable project to them. But it sort of seems like you weren't as focused on that this time around. This was more for you. This is more for me, but I do love my fans so much. And like, I want... I want to make them happy, but I also like, you know, I got to make what I actually want to listen to and what I want to perform uh, on on tour and things like that. But when I'm, yeah, when I'm in the studio, I think it's all, yeah, it's, it's all about just like what I want to hear in that moment, at, le at least these days. Um, with, yeah, with this project, I, I wasn't, I didn't have the, fans in mind the whole time probably not until it was like done really hmm. you know but but that was new for me because i've heard the past four years it's kind of been the opposite you know like uh, considering that how do you personally feel about things like you know when you're seeing these kind of like disconnects between the fans and kind of grasping what you're going for with stuff like, you know, the recent cover change where you, you know, you sort of like went from the kind of like furry figures to that, uh, you know, sort of like lone, almost kind of like unsettling masked uh, person on the front cover. And uh, pe some people are voicing that they feel frightened by uh, the new cover. I mean, you know, how much of that is maybe a misperception? How much of that is intentional? And they're just like not really appreciating it for what it is. Um, I just love entertainment so much and I love entertaining people and I love, uh, the discourse that comes with it. So like, I, to answer your question, it's all intentional. Hmm. Yeah. 
and and the cover, you know, it's it's not for shock value. It does represent something that's true to me the same way the you know the music is true to me and like I made the decision to really dial in on the genre I also made a decision to like really dial in on like uh, an aesthetic and a overall theme that I want to be uh, I want it to be like remembered in a very like specific way and, and sometimes I have to like choose the you know the image of the song that represents that feeling within me like in the most like uh i guess in the clearest way hmm. was kind of changing the cover also part of like you know what what seems like on, on in some way like a conscious effort to distance fans from or just people maybe generally stumbling across the record from like a vision of you or an expectation of what they know of you as as an artist because i mean as as some of the lyrics on this this record sort of overtly say it, it seems like you're letting go of a version of yourself or a perception of yourself in the process of making some of the songs on on this record yeah in a way and also I think I was just looking at my Spotify one day and I was like, oh, like I'm on my first album. I'm on the cover of my first album and the second. It'd be nice to, you know, with where I'm at in my career, the end of BH and moving forward, but starting over, it'd be nice to like really do something that represents this new chapter for me. Hmm. I want to go back to kind of an interesting point that you were making earlier as far as like the the sound of the record or what I guess maybe you could say is almost like like a racial androgyny to it in a way like making it so that people listening to the album can't tell if it's a white artist is it a black artist da 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 da, da. like I don't know, kind of, kind of getting into that generally because it's, it's such a huge topic. It's such a, you know, which is often not talked about, you know, but, but from your own perception as somebody who's consciously kind of playing with this idea, like what do you, what do you think accounts for in a general sense as best you can put it? Because, you know, this isn't going to be a perfect explanation here. Don't expect for it to be, but like, you know, what, what accounts for a black sound as opposed to like, as, as opposed to like a white sound per se? Hmm. Um, I will say, like, when I was in, let me see, the sixth grade and graduation came out and I heard I Wonder for the first time, my mind was, like, blown hmm. because uh, hearing, like, raps that were spaced out like that over, like, those type of chords, but then, like, the, it's like a Tupac sample for the drums. Hmm. Like, that just felt like the perfect, I think, merge of, like, cultures i guess is what i'm trying to say mm. and i that's the clearest like way i could explain it without sounding too crazy and i'm kind of always like chasing chasing that i mean there's a lot of print stuff that feels that way there's a lot of yeah there's a there's a lot of stuff that feels that way to me that i, that I like just naturally love and gravitate towards mm. but then if you if, if you look at like the individual members of Brockhampton, like, we don't really make sense together. But, like, that's just naturally who I am, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I mean, without sounding too crazy myself, because, I mean, I have my own opinions on this issue, and I find it, you know, in interesting that, I mean, obviously you have your own perspective on it. Like, it's difficult to define and say, but I could say, like, in my own experience or my own perception from, like, reviewing a lot of different albums and sort of, like, seeing what I review, what people take to, what's hot, what's not. I can't quantify it per se, but I, I can say at least from what I what I can view, a lot of what people prefer to listen to sub you know, subconsciously is almost like based in that. You know, this sort of like this familiarity or this comfort with whatever sounds or vibes they associate with musically like their race. You know, it's like the, the, they kind of like take to it faster or more easily. And sometimes I feel like without overtly saying it, because it's it's nothing that I feel like you can question people on and sort of like create a change with instantaneously. But um, without saying it, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to 
push people toward breaking out of that a little bit. Like, you know, listen, you know, here's a really cool thing that's almost like kind of merging these worlds together or sort of like blending these lines or showing you that like these lines are just imaginary. They're, they're only as there as you want them to be. So it's like, you know, how can you kind of like push past it or kind of like move beyond it? Yeah. I mean, have there been points in your life where as a music fan or creator or listener where you've sort of like felt those biases within yourself and you needed to kind of like move beyond it or sort of like try to challenge yourself? Yeah, I think after Ginger and how like, I, ju I just saw the way the internet kind of like fully leaned into us being a boy band mm. and I just want to do something that felt, you know, a little bit more confusing for a roadrunner, which is like just more rap focus, I guess, really. So that's like the last time I really remember like dealing with that mm. or thinking about it. And uh, I mean, for, for this record specifically, were the things you may have had to sort of like, you know, redo or rewrite or retool because maybe, I don't know, in a, in a way culturally they weren't coming across as androgynous enough in a way? I don't know. I think so. I think um, this album probably would have like blended in with the culture a little bit more if I threw like some raps on it or like singing raps, you know, like kind of like what I've done in the past. But I felt like <coughs> to really do like, um, yeah, to, to, to make it more, um, androgynous, I guess it would be, it'd be smarter to not put any raps on it. I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. No, like, no, and I also avoid like swearing and like, you know, just little things like that. Like, I, I wanted to feel like you don't really know who's sing like who's singing these songs if someone just shows it to you for the first time and you have no context at all. Mm. You know? Now, I remember, um, also this conversation is kind of reminding me, and, and not to get like you know, too in the weeds or ridiculous with it, but to, it, it reminds me of like a recent like Twitter beef that I had with like these uh random freaks who were all kind of like dogpiling on and hating on this band that i just retweeted and and it just so happened if i can like r recall correctly it was like it might have been like a white drummer black guitarist black lead singer and they were sort of just like do doing an indie thing you know and again i didn't really do anything other than just like kind of share it and there are a bunch of people that are just like kind of jumping out of being like, <clears throat> these guys suck. They're not talented. They're making shit music. And above all else, they're appropriating white culture. They're steal they're stealing white music because <laughs> it's like some indie shit or something like that. And, right. you know, it, it, it seems like we're starting to would like, you know, what, one of the interesting kind of results and positive results, I think, of kind of the you know, the paradigm shift that you were talking about earlier where, you know, you have these younger music listeners who are embracing everything is, you know, you, you do have a lot of up and coming black young artists who don't really see the boundary there, you know, between them and sort of just like making underground rock music, you know, that there's nothing stopping them from doing that. Like, you know, conversely, you could also say that is the case for like, you know, um, white music fans who want to make hip hop, but that's always been the case. Like, you know, if, as, for as long as there's been vanilla ice and fucking Eminem, like, you know, white people have felt entitled to make hip hop if they felt like making it, you know, it doesn't really so much feel like the inverse, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess the point that I'm saying here is even if you are trying to be androgynous in a way, you know, with how the music kind of comes off, um, you know, do, do you do you still see that you're sort of like it may be possibly contributing to this larger trend of artists in the black community who are who are sort of like, you know, getting in on the indie thing and sort of like, you know, contributing to that sound and contributing to that vibe uh, in a way? Yeah, 1000 percent. And then also just like, you know, uh, rap fans who aren't really into that sound. Mm. This is like a way to put them on. That's also how I feel about it even though it's a really big genre, but there might be some people that only like 
went to Brockhampton for like you know raps and beats and stuff and also at the core of this album I feel like it's very it's very hip-hop at its core it's very rap at its core with like just the energy of it and um just how it knocks and how loud it is and and also with like with how left of a decision it was for me to do this that feels very like hip-hop to me as well hmm. You know, it's it's maybe to sort of like rewind historically here a bit, because I don't know if you have sort of your own opinions on this, but it sort of seemed like in the early 2010s that things were going to go in that direction inevitably. But I'm kind of surprised that it's taken this long to sort of like start seeing the kinds of names and faces and people kind of, you know, making the music that we are. And, and the reason I say that is like, I remember how exciting and how sort of like widely discussed it was at the time when... Kanye dropped Dark Fantasy and it was like, oh, Boney Vare's on the record. And like, oh, look at this guy Drake who's on the come up and he's sampling Beach House. And oh, look at this other like huge rap artist who's like collaborating with this random fucking indie musician. You know what I mean? It it, it seemed like, I don't know, may, maybe I'm sort of expecting too much of an instantaneous reaction, but it, it seemed like in that moment there should have been this like, you know, radical explosion of like, yeah, let's just, we're going to make hip hop. We're going to make indie. Let's just mix it all up. But it didn't occur right then and there. Like, it seems like it's almost like been delayed a decade or so. And now we're finally kind of getting it a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember um, around that time you're describing when I was in high school, I rapped over uh, this song called Feather by Little Dragon. Because oh, yeah. I was like, yeah. yeah, I was really trying to do like some indie rap kind of thing. <laughs> that's interesting. Man. No, I mean, that was, that, that was, it was kind of an era and there, and there was a lot of, you know, kind of like weird fusions of indie rock and pop and electronic music and rap going on on the blogosphere. But then like, I feel like as that scene kind of died out and labels really kind of figured out, Hey, how, how they were going to game the streaming system to promote their biggest artists and the trendiest, most homogenous sounds that they possibly could. It, it, it seemed like there was almost kind of like a, a versatility that got kind of killed in the process of that. And, and now that's kind of coming back in a way, finally, it's, it's kind of like, you know, a plant growing up through the asphalt that was thrown on top of it. Yeah. Mm. That's great. I mean, what what you've done and been able to accomplish with this record, it, it, is this sort of a direction and, and vibe that you see yourself kind of, you know, sticking with uh, for a few chapters or so in your, in your career? Or do you feel like this was kind of like a, a holistic statement that you were able to encapsulate in this album and, and now you can just kind of move on to something else? Um. Um, right now, I'm interested in like carving out my own sound lane and island. Mm. So like my my audience knows like they can only get this specific sound from me. And so this will probably always find its way in my work. But I, I definitely like always want to switch it up. Mm. You know, always want to do the unexpected. But yeah and um you know with the themes across the record of you know you kind of looking back and, and referring to some of those like early experiences that you had of like crushes and romance and, and some of the music that you were hearing or being introduced to at that point like you know had, has there been anything going on in your life personally that has you thinking back to those experiences of of kind of young love or kind of like a budding romance in a way you know um, it probably was just the loss of my group, I guess. Mm. Kind of just had me like, you know, um, thinking about all my friendships and you know, the the last song is called "My Friend," but it's about all my friends, you know. So I think the whole the whole record is just dedicated to to friendship and. You know, just people um, I grew apart from or that I'm currently close with. Not to get all emo, but yeah. No, I mean, I think we were going to get emo. I mean, that was kind of the plan. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're still working with people like Ramil on this record, but I mean, you know, even with him still around, um, who, I mean, obviously you've been collaborating with him for a long time, but, uh, you know, even despite that, is there kind of like this greater 
loss of companionship, you know, through the process of obviously Brockhampton withering away and you kind of like going solo again? I think I only feel it because I still live in L.A. Mm. I, I think that's why I feel a little bit. So, like, you know, some of my um, best and worst memories that I have ever experienced with any, like, uh, friends happened here. So, like, I'm just reminded sometimes of it. But, yeah, I, I think I hope that answered it. Well, I mean, you know, obviously it's something that, you're dwelling on and, and maybe, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'm presuming too much, but uh, I, I imagine on some level missing in a sense. Have you personally been able to or creatively been able to find ways of kind of, you know, filling that void maybe that doesn't involve obviously Brockhampton or recreating or embracing something similar? Yeah, with the people that um, I worked on this album with. Mm. They inspired me to, uh, I guess, dream without limits again and to create without, you know, expectations other than just like, do you enjoy this or not? Um, yeah. And met by chance, truly. And, and I'm like forever thankful, honestly, because I, I don't at the beginning of the year, I told myself I don't um, I didn't know if I wanted to make an album. I don't know if I wanted to keep making music for this year, not like to be dramatic, but like I, I didn't know if I wanted to do it. Um, I kind of just fell into it. Just felt like just being pushed by by this new friend group I have. And and yeah, it was just me and, and them and Romel like every day for a few months, just trying to figure out, like crack the sound. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in that sense, does this record kind of feel like a group effort too? Because I, I, I think to a lot of fans, even if they are looking at the liner notes of the album, that may not necessarily come across because it, it is such a stripped back and kind of like skeletal project for you. You're not hearing a million different voices flying at you. And, and the what vocal variety you are hearing is you kind of changing your voice. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like a, you know, it's very much so my album, but I think throughout the rest of my career, I'll always be collaborative and like work with a team. Hmm. So yeah, it, it feels like a, a band project in a way. Hmm. I mean, manipulating your voice across the project in the way that you did, because it never just comes across one single way. You know, it's you kind of go at it in a, in a variety of different, you know, ways with different pitches and inflections. Like maybe was that in a way your your own personal attempt of recreating the sensation of like a, a wider world of perspectives or voices on a single record, even if it is just just you at the end of the day? I think so a little bit. I mean, like my favorite albums felt like that, like uh, 2001 mm -hmm. or Dark Fantasy uh, or even Jesus, like. You know, I like when it feels like it's a play or something and this character pops out and then goes away. Like, there's a song. There are two songs on my album that were, like, the vocals aren't me. And it's just my best friend. Right, right. But, but yeah, so, yeah, I think so. Hmm. Have you given a lot of thought of, like, what these songs are going to sort of be presented as, like, in the live setting behind uh, this record? I mean, I, I know, like, you know, as evidenced by other solo shows you've done on the Brockhampton stuff, like you tend to think pretty like theatrically sometimes about like how, uh, how live shows kind of come about. Yeah. I, I've spent like all year thinking about it. Well, as soon as I got into like the, the rhythm and I th I'm playing a uh, Tyler's festival camp vlog now this weekend. Right. And I think that'll be like, the introduction to what I'm trying to do, I guess. Yeah, I'm going to be live streaming and stuff, so be cool. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, any sort of like, you know, peak in terms of like any sort of uh, visuals or, you know, some of the figures and characters that we've been seeing kind of associated with this album cycle, will they be kind of like playing a role during uh, live shows or anything like that? 
I would, um, yeah, in some way, in some way. Okay. Yes, yes and no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, hey, listen. I, I appreciate you being as much of an open book as you've as you've been. I I, I know that uh, you know you have a tendency toward being you know kind of hush hush about certain things and, and not oh, willing to to tell it all, not reveal it all. So again, I appreciate it. Um, oh. it, it, it. Before you head out, is there anything else that uh, you kind of want to give us a, a a preview on, or anything that we need to be looking out for in the coming months? Uh, you know, more live shows, more visuals, more uh, extras from the record, anything like that. Um, yeah, more, all of that. Yeah. All okay. of that. Yeah. Honestly. Okay. Yeah. The one that I'm, um, taking much time off like ever again. So yeah, at least not four years or whatever, however long it was. Okay. How, do you see yourself falling much further into sort of like the coffee vortex? Are you, you know, sort of like kind of just dipping your toe in it? Um, or do you... <laughs> Do you yeah, think, I would do you, like. Do you, do you, yeah, do you, yeah, I might put out a cold brew soon. Okay, all right. Yeah, a, a bottled, a bottled Kevin Abstract cold brew. I'll make sure you get some. Thank you. Else. Thank you very much. I would die to review that. The darker one, though, right? No. Uh, you know what? Whatever I want it to be, your taste. So whatever, okay. whatever's your preference, whatever you feel like is the best. That's what. That's what I want to go with. Okay, bet I got you. Okay, awesome. All right, I'm a. <laughs> going to leave it there. Thank you very much for coming through and just, uh, you know, telling us everything about the, uh, uh, about the album. Thanks for having me. That was awesome. All right. Have a good one, man. See you. See ya. All right. Bye.